Hello, everyone, and thanks so much for being here. Um, we're right at the start of the hour, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our moderator, Kate, to get us started today. Welcome, Kate. Good morning, well, good afternoon, everyone. It's my morning over in Australia. And thanks for coming to the second part of this special session that's looking at emerging actions for sustaining biodiversity in fire prone ecosystems. I'm Kate Gillen. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Melbourne in Australia. And I'm also one of the session organizers with Luke Kelly, also from the University of Melbourne and Bob Keane, who I expect most of you know. We'd like to start today's session by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands where I am based. These are the uh, Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to their elders past and present. If anyone else would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands they're on, please feel free to add it to the chat on the Hoover app. We have a really great lineup of speakers today addressing a variety of viewpoints, and I'm excited to hear what they have to say. If you have speak, uh, questions for the speakers, please add them to the Hoover app or um, chime in when I open up questions after each talk. Also going to mention that we have a fire circle at this time tomorrow, and it'd be great to see you all there. So um, as I'm the first speaker today, I should get started. I'll just share my screen. So my talk is about scenario planning for ecological fire management. And um, today I'm going to show you how co-design um, and scenario planning can help develop creative fire management strategies to support conservation aims. So this is some work that I've been doing with Luke and with other colleagues from the Melbourne, from the University of Melbourne, and um, also La Trobe University and with land management agencies. <clears throat> so as we know, fire regimes around the world are changing. And to protect biodiversity, we need strong place-based um, solutions built on ecological knowledge. As species respond to different aspects of the fire regime, and there are many actions managers could take, deciding on the best action or the best approach now to get benefits into the future is hard. But a promising way that we can approach this is through linking empirical biodiversity data co-design scenario planning and fire regime simulation. So co-design involves stakeholders in the project conceptualization and design. It can be used to integrate multiple views and place-based knowledge. It can also support um, learning, which is a key aim of adaptive management. Scenario planning uses a structured approach to help understand how ecosystems might change and which scenarios or strategies will sustain biodiversity. As such, it has a really key role in um, climate change research and has been advocated by IPVES to explore future trends. So we can link the outputs from these approaches and um, forecast future trends in fire and biodiversity and use this to aid decision-making. So I'm going to talk about our experience doing this with conservation managers in the Mallee of Southeastern Australia. So the Mallee, these are extensive fire prone eucalypt woodlands in semi arid region of Southern Australia. It has lots of amazing biodiversity, including many endemic species and species of conservation concern. In the map on the left, here we can see that although there's been significant clearing from the prior distribution, um, large swathes of Mallee remain, and that's the dark grey. And so the study area is the inset in the um, in the right, and um, this is these three parts are where we undertook this research. 
and they have a combined area of approximately 700,000 hectares. These parks are managed for environmental values, uh, which makes it a really great place to undertake work like this. <clears throat> there have been a wealth of field studies undertaken in the Mallee over the last 30 years, and these have revealed relationships between fire, plants and animals and shown a real diversity of needs. Many plants re-sprout after fire, but there are also fire sensitive species, such as the silver hakea, which is in the top on the left over there, and the scrub cypress pine below it. And these species are killed by fire. Mallee vegetation structure is strongly influenced by fire and animals use different seral habitats, post-fire seral habitats. For example, the common dunnart and painted dragon, the two pictures at the top there, use the open conditions of early seral habitats and the threatened Mallee emu wren and the marsupial Ningawi in the middle require mid seral habitats with large spiky hummock grasses that provide shelter. And arboreal mammals, such as the pygmy possum in the bottom there, um, and various birds use tree hollows only present in older seral habitats. And other species, such as the mallee fowl and the western grey kangaroo, require a diversity of seral stages. And managers want to use this knowledge of biodiversity to plan their fire management. And this is where scenario planning can be an extremely helpful way to approach management. So in this project, we facilitated a series of workshops with over 30 stakeholders, including fire planners, land managers, policy makers, and scientists. Key steps of the approach were to design um, define management objectives, identify performance measures that relate to each objective, uh, develop alternative fire management strategies. And our aim here was really to develop a set of strategies that would help us learn about Mali ecosystems and how to sustain biodiversity. The main action that the managers wanted to explore was the strategic use of planned burning. Aside from fire suppression, this is currently the main tool they have at their disposal, but there's many ways it could be done. And so after much deliberation during the workshops, uh, we all arrived at six creative strategies. And these strategies really reframed our well, the stakeholders' perception of how st uh, strategic burning could be done in these landscapes. So I'll just run through the, um, the strategies quite quickly. Um, so our first strategy was status quo, and it was based on the current approach to management and it uses strategic breaks. So these are large landscape scale corridors that are depicted in the orange there, and they really aim to minimize the risk posed by large wildfires burning extensive areas of the park. Our second strategy was a um, modified burn placement. And this was exploratory in the sense that the interest was really to move the strategic breaks from the western corner of the park to protect threatened species habitat. But the managers were really concerned a wildfire is going to be bigger if we do this. Our third strategy was a small block strategy. This took a complete break from the way um, that management is currently done in the landscape. Specifically, it was looking at removing the strategic breaks and putting small scale burns across the landscape. And they really questioned whether this would be able to change fire behavior. And so all the, the small burns were done in the light green area, which is the broad scale burning area. And these three strategies all had a annual hectare target of 6,600 hectares that they were aiming to burn per year. Great. Our fourth strategy was an increased burning strategy. This had the same spatial arrangement, but it doubled the annual burning target, 14,000 hectares. We then had a minimal burning strategy. This halved the amount of burning done in the landscape per year and specifically reduced the size of the strategic breaks. 
We then had a suppress only strategy, which had no planned burning. So these six strategies were all run with two scenarios of low and high suppression. And then we had a baseline do nothing strategy, which we compared the management strategies to. To predict the interaction of future wildfire and management strategies, we used a new simulation tool, um, Frost, uh, that was developed by researchers in Australia, including Trent Panman, who's talking in the Bayesian Network session. So this is a mechanistic fire behaviour simulation model. It, uh, well, it includes a mechanistic fire behaviour simulation with Bayesian Network. And the point here is to incorporate variability and uncertainty in future events and conditions. We had two probabilistic nodes, one for weather and one for ignition, and fuel treatment and suppression varied by strategy. We used the fire history from 2019, which is what's pictured on the left there, and ran the simulations for 100 years with 50 reps per strategy. A key, a really key part of scenario planning is identifying the management objective and the performance measures associated with that. So the overarching objective was to maintain fire regimes to promote fire diversity. And we had three sub-objectives that we could really measure. Um, so the first was to minimize the risk of large wildfires. Managers are quite concerned by fires greater than 10,000 hectares, as although these are very rare, the large fires risk burning the entire habitat of threatened species. They can homogenize the landscape and destroy critical habitat features, like hollow bearing trees that take over 80 years to develop. Our second objective was to minimize inappropriate fire intervals for flora. And we measured this using tolerable fire intervals. And these consider immaturity risk and senescence risk. So here, the minimal interval is set by the species that matures the last in the community. And this was the scrub cypress pine at 25 years. And the maximum interval is set by the species that goes locally extinct first. And that's in the absence of fire. And this was a silver hekia at 90 years. Our third objective was to maintain critical habitat for fauna. And here we used a fauna index, and this combines species expected relative abundance in post fire seral stages to predict how the faunal community will change given the amount of each stage present in the landscape. And we used data on 86 species, including birds, reptiles, and mammals. We then ran these simulations and analyze the results. And I'll show you the outcome for just the dominant vegetation type Triodia mallee. So for our first objective, this plot shows the mean and 95% confidence intervals on the Y axis for the largest wildfires and the corresponding total area burnt by wildfire and planned fire on the X axis. I'm just going to focus on the Y axis here we can see that all strategies significantly reduced maximum wildfire size from do nothing, which is the open circle in the top right. With high suppression, that's the purple, all strategies were almost equally effective at minimizing the largest wildfires. But with low suppression in orange, strategies were more differentiated. Suppress only, that's the triangle, was clearly less effective. Increased burning, the field box um, was performed marginally best. I couldn't hear that, sorry. Sorry about that. I think that was just background noise from somebody. I think I okay. successfully muted them. <laughs> Lovely, thank you. Okay, so um, increased burning, the field box performed marginally best. And there was little difference between the other strategies, including the small blocks, the box with the cross in it that didn't involve the strategic breaks. And this was really quite surprising to park managers. Our second strategy, our second measure, sorry, um, we found the strategies performed quite differently. 
these graphs show the proportion of area below the minimum tolerable fire interval on the left and above the maximum tolerable fire interval on the right. And the x-axis shows the change over time. So as you'd logically expect, strategies with more planned burning, the darker lines have more area below the minimum interval and conversely, less area above the maximum. And you can also see that the ranking um, flips between the minimum and the maximum. If both intervals are equally important, then the small blocks minimizes the area outside both bounds. Interestingly, the do nothing strategy in yellow had little area below the minimum, despite having no fire suppression. The strategies perform differently again for fauna. And here we have the percent change in the fauna index on the y axis and part time on the x axis. And what we can see is that the index increases with status quo, modified burn placement, and small blocks. They're the blues at the top. And that's because these have a diversity of sterile stages which benefit fauna. Specifically, they've got large amounts of the mature stage, which is really has been shown to be beneficial for many threatened birds. With increased burning, the darkest, the index decreases. Although it also has a lot of the mature stage, it has hardly any of the older growth mallee. The suppress only decreases the most, that's the green, as it has basically nothing much but very old mallee. Interestingly, the do nothing, the yellow, did quite well as it produced a diversity of sterile stages. So we can bring this all together by ranking their strategies for their ability to meet the objectives. In this diagram, each objective has been ranked individually and then the scores combined to form an overall ranking where one is the best and seven is the worst. With these three objectives, we see that small blocks performs the best for two objectives, the yellow, Status quo, modified burn placement and increased burning perform best or tied best for one objective and that small blocks performs best overall. Summaries such as these can provide a robust and transparent way to assess candidate management strategies. We can see where the strategies perform well and where they don't. Importantly, these measures, the ranking is based upon the objectives um, that were decided on by stakeholders and they're underpinned by empirical data. So in summary, by linking comprehensive biodiversity data with co-design and scenario planning, we can help explore creative management strategies that build on local knowledge and test new ideas. We can forecast future changes in ecosystems, which helps us learn about the ecosystems and using measures that are underpinned by empirical data really helps provide strong evidence to inform decision making that can benefit multiple aspects of biodiversity. So I would like to say thank you for listening and many thanks to my collaborators, funders and the co-design partners. Okay, stop sharing. Thanks, I'll just stop this now. Questions. Do I have a moment for questions? Yeah, go ahead and take a question and I'll just prepare our next presentation. Fantastic. Thank you. Does anybody have a question? Let's see. Um, if you do have one, please just unmute yourself and shout out because I can't see any in the Q&A. Great, I'll go ahead and play our next uh, uh, pre-recorded presentation. Okay, should just I just give a quick a introduction? Yes, please. Yes, okay. So our second speaker today is Dr. Adrian Rejos from the Forest Science Center of Catalonia in Spain. Adrian does some really interesting research at the intersection of biodiversity conservation, changing land use, climate change, and wildfire in Southern Europe. Um, I don't think that Adrian is able to join us today, uh, but we can attempt to pass on questions if people have them. Okay, thank you.
Hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to this interesting symposium. It's a great pleasure to, to be here. I decided to, to send the presentation because in Spain is not the best time, uh, especially for when, when you have kids. Well, today I will talk a little, a little bit about some resources that are coming up from a project uh, called Fire Smart, which I'm, I'm, I'm coordinating with my colleagues in Spain and Portugal. Uh, I will present some resources, but I will focus more on how to use fire to enhance uh, rewilding uh, in, in mountain, land, mountain uh, abandoned landscapes. Our study area is located in, in the in Southern Europe and in the Iberian Peninsula, and the Mediterranean regions are paradigmatic examples of human and fire modulated landscapes. The problem here with the wildfires, as in many other regions of the world, is that uh, we have a, an increasing number of large and high intensity fires. Uh, and, and firefighters cannot stop that, that kind of fires, also no mega fires. Um, this is because, as, as you know uh, very well, to climate warming in the Mediterranean uh, basin, we expect warmer and drier climate uh, conditions and also um, more fre frequent uh, stream, climate stream events. At the regional uh, and local scale, uh, especially in marginal mountain areas in southern Europe, we have the, the rural and urban processes that have taken place since the last century, over the last uh, 50, 60 years ago, due to the rural exodus. This uh, trend is uh, increased field accumulation and continuity, uh, creating more flammable landscapes. It is also helped indirectly by the fire suppression policies, in which are based on stopping all fires as soon as possible leading to a kind of uh, firefighting trap because it's contributing to to have more fuel and more flammable landscapes so this is the contest and um, um, well the the fire smart project is funded by uh, the portuguese government it was um, a specific call in 2080 after the the mega fires of 2016 where more than 100 people in portugal and the main, uh, well, this project aims to, to reduce the wildfire damage, but um, ensuring biodiversity conservation and delivery of different ecosystem services. So we are trying to integrate both the ecological and the socioeconomical dimension of the wildfire problem. Uh, the concept of the fire smart is not really new, um, but it can define as it's a kind of integrated approach based on different field conversions and treatments to reduce the impact of wildfires, but at the same time, maximizing the ecological benefits of fires. So it has emerged um, as a promotion, uh, promotion option to incorporate the role of fire as a ecological process into a strategic planning to, re, uh, to try to, to coexist with wildfires in a more sustainable way. Here, I bring this, um, this a nice image which is, in fact, is actually uh, um, from from, uh, from the last report of the WWF in, in Spain, because they use some of our studies to support um, recommendations in the last report. Um, that's why the, the name of these uh, scenarios are in, in, in Spanish, but I, I will explain you. So this is basically the, the type of scenarios that we are trying to implement in our project. So we design different scenarios, and finally, uh, we try to implement those scenarios in in a modeling platform to so supported by by simulations. The business as usual um, scenario is the, the land abandon trend. So here we represent it with more forests, more restoration, more flammable landscape. Then we design uh, alternative scenarios from based on European policy promoting agricultural areas in in our region. These areas are related with extensive agricultural and livestock activities and are very rich in terms of biodiversity. So, but they are also known as high native value farmlands, especially here in, in Europe. Then we also envisage a, 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 a fire smart strategy with a conversion from the, post, um, the fast growing trees plantations, and mostly pinus and, and eucalyptus plantations here in our region to oak native uh, forests, which are more, uh, more fire resistant. And finally, we consider a combination of both scenarios and then we implement in our models. So we try to answer 
how different land use and fire suppression scenarios can contribute to wildfire mitigation, but at the same time, what is the effect on biodiversity of different ecosystem services? We try to identify what is the best scenario, the best solution, and also consider what happened if the best option is not viable. So uh, we finally try to answer how this land abandonment trend could be managed with fire to enhance uh, the, the, the conservation and, 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 and to reduce the, the negative impacts of, of land abandonment processes. In the biosphere reserve and the Resures is one of our study areas and is uh, located between Spain and Portugal. It's the typical mountain landscape in between Eurosiberian is a transitional area between the Mediterranean and Eurosiberian region, largely affected by, by, by land abandonment processes and many fires every year. And because of this, I mean, also the historical use of by, by the local communities to, for pastures and, and so on. So, in the first uh, study that we published last year, we designed these scenarios, the units as usual, high native value farmland, fire smart, and the combination of both, and we implement those scenarios, management scenarios in our modeling platform. So, the model is called Mains, um, it's implemented in the in CELIS, CELIS is a um, landscape simulator. So this model is able to simulate the process related with fire, fire emission, spread, and extinction. We have a couple, a couple of fire suppression strategies. And also considering uh, or combining, uh, combining this information with, uh, with a land use demand allocation model, which allows us to incorporate the, the, land use, uh, the land use scenarios. So the conversion from one land cover type to another. Uh, our simulations um, uh, support the, the implementation of high native value farms on the landscape as the best option. So here we can see the business as usual, and we can see that the, 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 the burn area that is expected under this scenario is much larger than the, the well, it's larger than the historical records. Um, the fire uh, smart strategy by itself is not enough to have an effect on the fire gene. So the best option is the high, the increasing, increasing high native value farmland systems by um, by along or in combination with fire smart strategy, which are represented by the red color. So here we have the best options: high native value farmland, um, the larger the area uh, of of cropland and, and agricultural areas, the larger is the suppress area, um, and makes sense because uh, uh, these open areas really continue to the landscape and provide opportunities. Uh, to firefighters to stop uh, to stop the fires, but what happened in terms of biodiversity or other ecosystem services? According to our models, and here um, we model more than 100 vertebrate species that are breeding in, in our region, including uh, birds, uh, reptiles, and uh, amphibians. Uh, what we found is that again the high native value farmlands um, scenario, uh, but and the combination with fire smart strategy is the best the best option in terms of, of habitat availability for the next years uh, within uh, and outside the protected areas of this transboundary region. Uh, the only exception is the, the, the some endemic species within the protected area which are benefited by, by land abandonment processes, only amphibious and some, some forest dwelling species. Uh, however, in terms of carbon sequestration, which is related with climate uh, mitigation services, we found that uh, our models support the, the, the implementation of fire smart strategies as the best option, followed by the, the, the business as usual. These are the, the best uh, options in terms of carbon storage. However, the high native value farmland system, uh, together, the, together with the fire smart strategies, are also quite good, uh, allow us to keep the, the services um, over time. So the problem is that the implementation, the real implementation on the ground of the, these European policies, um, agricultural policies is failing. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the, the extension of the cultural is depressing and, um, and also increasing high uh, intensity agricultural in, in other regions. More, uh, and so in, mo in marginal mountain areas, which are no longer viable so from a socioeconomic point of view, the, the, the implementation of these high native farmlands is being a bit difficult. So. That's why we, we ask what happened, okay, if we consider rewilding as an opportunity, because there are 
obviously there are benefits associated with the with this uh, process of the forest re restoration the, here we understand rewilding as a passive or ecological rewilding this is the, the, the um, you know the let the the, the, the the ecological processes without human intervention to to, to restore um, ecosystems and um, it was found to be good for provide best conservation we also found that it was good for carbon sequestration but the problem is that there are potential um, increase in the wildfire risk and also the loss of open habitat species. Many of them are endangered species in, in associated with parrots in Europe. So here we uh, consider in the next uh, in this next study, we also consider these two land use scenarios, contrasting scenarios, the rewilding created dominated by land abandoned processes, and the high need to value farmland scenario, mimicking. Uh, European and rural policies were trying to um, they are trying to to to, to keep the uh, extensive agricultural and livestock activities. But then we also consider three levels of fire suppression effectiveness. So we have a scenario of letting fires burn, we relax fire suppression, then we mimic the current fire suppression in another scenario with the current uh, capacity, and then we also consider the under scenario with high fire suppression levels where the firefighters will be uh, able to stop almost all fires uh, under um, any any situation. So uh, we combine the land use scenario with the fire suppression policies. And we finally got six uh, scenarios. We apply the same modeling framework for the same species. And we analyze the effects on fire regime and biodiversity, what we found is again that around 30,000 hectares of additional suppressed area in comparison with the rewilding scenarios. Here we can see the other opportunities and the higher net value for an scenario with low fire suppression. We have more all fires, open spaces, and, and, and uh, habitat, um, um, this opportunistic uh, strategy. In terms of biodiversity, the best scenario is the high native value farmland because 70% uh, of the species could be favored by this strategy. But also, we have uh, around 20 species uh, that would be benefit from, from rewilding and abandoned processes, which is uh, especially interesting because many of them are endangered and endemic species. Then we have around 30% of the species that will be benefit from the open habitats created by fire. Um, only 50. 15 species that will be uh, positively affected by high levels of fire suppression. So as an optimal scenario, we will have the high native value farmlands with high levels of fire suppression. But uh, in this scenario, we, we should be very careful in terms of uh, strategic planning to avoid strain fire events uh, from the firefighting trap efforts. Um, in as alternative scenario, we could, we could propose um, a rewilding modulated by fire as a potential need of resolution when agricultural policies fail. So we can control the effects on unplanned fires, reinforce that they prescribe burning, or in, a, um, in this context of, of land abandonment to offset in some way the negative effects of rewilding. Uh, of course, the probably the best option would be analyze uh, uh, or try to combine the implementation of both strategies, uh, rewilding in, in, in the most um, uh, marginal areas and in the more productive and lowland uh, areas would be more uh, feasible with implementation of, of, of these high need to value foreign systems. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you also to uh, other institutions that are in, in the project. Here you can see the, the website, the, the social media, and also a link to a very nice uh, video where animation that we made um, to help disseminate the, the results. And I, I really invite you to, to see the, the, the video. Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, that was a great um, presentation by Adrian. So unfortunately, Adrian, isn't able to join us um, today to take questions. Um, so 
If you do have any questions, please feel free to add them to the, um, the Hoover app and Adrian will hopefully get a chance to have a look at them. And um, I'm sure he'll be very interested to hear what you've got to say. So should we move on to our next speaker or should we wait for um, five minutes? Uh, I think we can wait a couple of minutes and see if other folks plan on joining us. And uh, that will give me an opportunity to make a couple of announcements that I did not make at the beginning of our session today. Okay, so thanks. I want to let everyone know that we are recording this session and it will be available in Whova, our conference app, within two weeks after the Congress ends. And um, as Kate has been mentioning, if you'd like to ask any of our speakers a question during the session, please use the Q&A to the right of your screen. Um, the, and the chat window is also where you can engage with uh, fellow attendees. Um, also, everyone's been doing great, but we kindly ask you that you keep your microphones and cameras off during the presentations and follow the presenter's lead on when to engage with cameras and microphones on. Um, so I think we'll just give it a couple minutes here and then uh, Kate, you can feel free to go ahead and get started. So just to make sure we catch anyone that is going to be joining us, uh, we'll start in about three minutes. Hello again. So um, I, I'm just going to introduce our next speaker. And we have the uh, Assistant Professor Kate Wilkin from San Jose State Uni, where she heads the Wilkin Fire Ecology Lab. And she's also a member of the Wildfire Interdisciplinary Research Centre. Uh, Kate's research focuses on how we can live sustainably in fire prone ecosystems and spans fire ecology and management from the wildlands to the urban interface. And I'm very interested to hear what Kate has to say today. So um, Kate will be around for questions afterwards. So please stick them on the app or chime in. Thanks. Hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you all today to discuss biodiversity and fire. It's one of um, a topic of great interest to myself. And so I'm gonna be presenting a talk today entitled Pyrodiversity and Biodiversity in the Sierra, Sierra Nevada Mixed Conifer Forest of California with the Restored Fire Regime. 
Ultimately, this talk could also be entitled, Does Pyrodiversity Beget Plant Diversity? Um, and you know, as an ecologist and as a biologist, I always think that diversity begets diversity. Um, but we really, I really wanted to test this idea related to fire and different types of fire. And so the idea of pyrodiversity, to the best of my knowledge, it was coined by Martin and Sapsis in 1992, and they outlined the mechanisms that occur in an active fire regime that could influence biodiversity. So the season of fire, the severity of fire, or how many trees die, the extent of fire, how large it is, the frequency, how often they occur, and also any compounded disturbances like drought or um, severe storms. And Martin and Sapsis talked about pyrodiversity um, in these different ways. They also went on to talk about how um, pyrodiversity could influence biodiversity. And they have some very logical arguments about how this might occur. So the season of fire would alter the potential colonizers and species response to disturbances. The severity um, would kill or release seed banks and vegetation. The extent of the fire would alter the, the dispersal capabilities of uh, species. The frequency selects for climax or early successional species that are resist or species that are resistant or resilient to fire. And compound disturbances um, just recognizes that there are many things that happen in, in addition to fire that can um, increase or decrease those effects. And so beyond just the patterns of fire severity, all of these aspects of fires contribute to how fires may influence biodiversity. And historically, a lot of the fire and biodiversity literature has mainly been focused on, um, on fire severity, in part because there are very few areas that are truly pyrodiverse that have good historical data. And so we chose to work in Yosemite National Park's Illouette Creek Basin, where they've had natural lightning strikes occurring since the 1960s. And similarly, the Sugarloaf Valley of Kings Canyon National Park. Both of these areas were part of the early Let It Burn programs, which I think now the political, politically correct term might be managed wildfire. It keeps changing, so it's hard to keep up with the terms. Uh, but these are great places for observational studies and to ask questions about diversity and fire and pyrodiversity. So this is in the central Sierra Nevada mountains of California with mixed conifers um, ranging from about 5,000 to 8,500 feet. Um, some of the species include Jeffrey pine, um, lodgepole pine, red fir, and white fir. Um, both Illouette and Sugarloaf Basins are natural experiments where fire suppression was stopped. Um, I'm oh, sorry, where there was fire suppression beginning in the late 1800s when um, the Calvary came into the mountains of the Sierra Nevada in California, um, but that was stopped in the early 1970s. Since there's been more than 50 fires which exceeded 100 acres with mixed severity. And so in these areas, um, we're, here we are looking at a map of all the fire perimeters that have occurred since 1970 to about 2010. And what we see is that these fires start to become self-limiting. And, and it's really amazing. This is from some of Brandon Collins' early work. You can see that these fires become self-limiting and that these fires start to fit together like a jigsaw puzzle. One of the really amazing things um, about this area also is looking um, at the diversity of landscapes here. And so here, um, here we are looking at a map of California. You can see here the central, the Sierra Nevada, and then within the central Sierra Nevada, we have Yosemite National Park in Kings Canyon. For reference, um, I am down over here in San Jose today. And so for the study, we had a large network of plots um, from the early, that were sampled in the early 2000s and again, um, in 2010, and these plots had experienced anywhere from one to six fires in, in these areas that were ignited from lightning strikes. Um, and these areas, um, you know, look like a lot of the classic mixed conifer forests that people have described for California. You know, John Muir said, you can put your arms out and ride a horse through the stand. And so we definitely had some of the areas that looked like that. We also had areas um, that had beautiful charismatic megaflora or these beautiful grasses. Um, we had um, shrublands after high severity fire. We had some areas 
um, that had quite a lot of fuel on the ground um, and more. And so these are just, you know, some of the, the diversity of plant communities that we saw throughout the Illouette Creek Basin and Sugarloaf Valley. And so ultimately, um, when we looked at these areas, we saw um, that these forests had a quilt-like quilt -like pattern um, with these different types of plant communities very close together. Our specific questions um, were to describe the plant communities that developed in the frequent upper mixed conifer um, forest to de determine if biodiversity influenced um, plant species richness and diversity and determine the plot neighborhood scale at which biodiversity would be most important. And then also to understand the most important environmental and fire variables that influence plant communities through space and time at the plot scale. For the purposes of today's talk and because our talk is relatively short, I really wanna focus on this question of pyrodiversity. And so Lauren Panicio and I, one of the co-authors, thought about how we could describe pyrodiversity, this diversity of fire experiences. You know, so what season did you burn? How long ago? How severe was the fire? And how many times? And so we synthesized this fire experience um, into a, a single landscape diversity metric. And this really goes beyond high severity or, um, or low severity. Um, which a lot of the common literature has historically focused on. So we included things like fire year, fire severity, and number of times burnt. Um, and these were inherently included because we were looking at rasters of all of the fire severities, and fire perimeters through time in the study system. So here we have an example um, of a plot. And this plot had you know, burned with low severity in 1994, moderate severity in 2001, and then low severity again in 2004. Another plot burned with low, very low, and then it was unburned in the more recent fires. Ultimately, um, these experiences were synthesized into one single fire history variable. It went from rare to common. And we could look at this metric across the landscape. And so here is a, an example of a portion of the Illouette Creek Basin. And you can see here, you know, here's an individual plot and the buffers around it where we could um, look at diversity metrics of biodiversity. And so here are a few reasons why we thought this particular metric was cool. It captures multiple aspects of fire history that contribute to fine scale heterogeneity. It can be calculated at many different scales. And so for this analysis, we first try to understand which types of pyrodiversity were important. And so this is the first set of equations that we looked at. So for each plot, we looked at um, richness or diversity would be Y here with time since fire, the most recent fire severity. And then we looked at a few different diversity metrics for the fire, for the pyrodiversity layer. And we looked at those at 25, 50, 75, 100, and 250 meter buffers around our plots. And once we found a, um, we, then we did a model competition and the model that had um, the best AIC um, that biodiversity metric and scale went on to inform our second set of equations. And so here is the ultimate um, equation that we used for reporting in a recent paper. And so we looked at the plot-based fire experiences. So if you're at a plot, when was the last time this area burned? What was the fire severity there? Um, and then also what was the neighborhood experience? So what was your pyrodiversity? And then how did that interact with time since fire and most recent fire? We also looked at environmental factors like shrub cover, percent slope, canopy cover, soil moisture, little litter depth, elevation, solar radiation, and climatic water deficit. We had a few random effects as well. And ultimately, um, you know, this was used to determine the magnitude of impact of um, plot-based fire experience, biodiversity, and also these environmental variables. And so for richness, what we found was that the soils, the climatic water deficit, and the functional divergence of pyrodiversity at 50 meters were the most important variables. And so here, looking at soils, um, we can see for the four soil types, loams, sand, sandy clay loam, and sandy loam, we see um, that, that these are slightly different from one another. And in fact, um, some of, if, depending on which type of soil was present, you, you may see up to eight additional plant species. For climatic water deficit, this was another variable 
um, that was important and climatic water deficit had an inverse relationship with richness as climatic water deficit increased from 360 to 620 richness decreased from 23 to 17 species. And so these both you know, influence the overall um, plant richness. We also saw that areas that had um, functional divergence at 50 meters, when they had um, higher amounts of functional divergence, those areas also influenced richness. And so what we saw was that for areas with functional divergence um, going from zero to eight, we saw an increase in plant richness going from 26 to 57 species. And this was for only areas that had moderate severity fire. Moderate severity fire was unique from all of the other types of fire severities. The other types of fire severities were similar. Um, so what we saw was if you have moderate severity fire um, and high functional divergence, you'd see that you have up to 31 additional species. And what's really interesting um, for me to think about is, you know, as a biologist, I recognize, you know, that, you know, soils and moisture are always very important for plants. Um, but here we're showing that both the plot scale fire effect of fire severity and biodiversity um, combine to have the largest magnitude of impact on the number of species that are present on the plot. And for Simpson's diversity, what we found um, was that canopy cover was the main driver of diversity. Um, and ultimately, um, biodiversity did not influence Simpson's diversity at all. And so, you know, does pyrodiversity beget plant biodiversity? Um, you know, we could say that for the understory, it was significantly but weakly influenced by plot scale variables such as um, canopy openness, soil texture, and moisture. Individual aspects of fire regime um, did not influence the understory directly, um, but when but we saw significant and strong influences between the interaction of regional scale pyrodiversity indices and fire severity. And so ultimately, you know, does pyrodiversity beget biodiversity across taxa? This, this is evidence that it, for, you know, the Sierra Nevada, for California Sierra Nevada mountains, mixed conifer forests, we see um, that pyro, the greater pyrodiversity does foster biodiversity of plants for the understory at 50 meters in scale. You know, previous work that I've done also collaborating with Lauren Panicio showed that we saw similar trends with pollinators, but they were at a slightly larger scale, likely because they're more mobile. Um, and that for that previous work, we also saw that the interactions of plants and pollinators, pollinators were also important at 150 meters. Um, and more recently, I've been trying to think about, you know, how does this, um, how does pyrodiversity um, really apply to other systems? Um, uh, especially systems that are not like the Sierra Nevada mixed conifer forest, where historically, um, which historically had high pyrodiversity. Um, what, how does pyrodiversity act in systems that are different from this? Uh, you know, from systems that are um, notorious for having high severity fires, infrequent high severity fires like California's chaparral um, or maybe lodgepole pine forests. Um, and so, Looking forward, I have a lot of questions that I hope that we can talk about as a group about um, how we could um, try to think about biodiversity. Um, so one idea to think about potentially for the discussion tomorrow is other biodiversity metrics. I also really like Zach Steele's recent take on biodiversity metrics where he looked at the individual aspects of um, you know, time, extent, frequency, and was able to have a metric for each of those. Um, also, for pyrodiversity, for this analysis, we looked at pyrodiversity as one metric. Um, but could we do something similar for environmental diversity? So could we come up with an envir environmental, for a single environmental diversity metric, you know, maybe focused on soils and moisture and slope? Another question I have is, does pyrodiversity foster diversity across all fire regimes? And I suspect this is of great interest to people um, um, in this session, especially in Australia, as they try to understand um, what to, how to move forward, right? Another question I have um, that I would love um, help with answering in the future is how can we define biodiversity in uniform, in systems that maybe have a more uniform severity? So for example, in a high severity chaparral stand, um, 
So ultimately, when we walk through a burned um, chaparral shrubland, you know, as an ecologist, I see that there are very different, while the stand has um, experienced high severity, there are very different um, amounts of fire intensity or energy that went through that stand. And I can see that based on the width of the branches that are remaining or the diameter of the branches that remain. And so those are some of the questions I have um, based on my research and others work about some of these ideas of biodiversity and biodiversity. I'm happy to take any questions and comments. I would just also like to thank um, everyone who helped with this project. This was a project that I think uh, more, where more than 30 um, students and um, graduate students have collected data over you know, more than 20 years as part of the Stevens Lab at UC Berkeley. Great, thank you. That was a really interesting talk, Kate. Um, so to kickstart the questions, I have a question um, from Dominic, who's another speaker in our session here. So I'll just read it out, if that's okay. So Kate, your measures of biodiversity are plot-based and therefore alpha diversity was the main metric. Did you look at beta diversity across gradients, which in this case is the gradient in fire severity, it may not show up at plot scales. Um, that miss variability along transitional gradients. Higher diversity is, is scale dependent. There's a lot more to it. Do you agree? Um, yes. A really um, first take on looking at pyro diversity in the system. And we're utilizing a long term plot network um, to look at um, biodiversity. If we were thinking about um, trying to think about more of um, beta diversity, we would probably use different, a different sampling strategy, but we were trying to maximize the use of a pre-existing long-term data set. Right. Hmm. Um, does anybody else have any questions for Kate? Oh, oh who is that? Luke? Yes, please. Hi. Hi, Kate. Great talk. That's fascinating to see these landscapes and the photos and to hear about this, this different part of the world for us in Australia. Um, one thing we found in Australia is that, you know, there's lots of different ways, like you say, to measure biodiversity, and lots of them are actually pretty good. So I was wondering, like, is, does your data suggest that there's quite a bit of resilience with the plants? Like, are there, instead of aiming for one particular form of biodiversity, is there actually, like, quite a bit of space there that, that is pretty good for biodiversity? I'm interested. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, looking at the preliminary results um, from this work, when we looked at just, you know, the different types of pyrodiversity and the different scales, um, the majority of them had a positive effect on increasing richness. Um, but they, you know, obviously had very different magnitudes. Um, and the other thing to note also just is that when we look at what influenced plants the most, it was functional divergence at 50 meters. But when we look at what influenced pollinators the most, it was more of a classic mm. Simpsons diversity at 150 meters. Ah, interesting. Cool. So, Thanks. We'll talk soon. Um, you know, they're similar, but they're also different. Yes. Uh, maybe one more time for one quick question, if anyone has one. Hmm. Doesn't look like it. I, I can't, can you see one? No, thank you no so much. Thank, thank you. you. That was a really fascinating talk. Thank you. Um, okay, so our third speaker today is Dr. James Welsh. And um, James is an anthropologist and researcher of human ecology. So that's a real different look at this, um, this concept. And so he is from the Brazilian National School of Public Health, and he's also the scientific, uh, the National Council for Scientific and Technological Development in Brazil. His research addresses the interface between environment, culture, and health among indigenous peoples. So I'm really looking forward to hearing um, James's talk today. Thank you. My name is James Welch. 
I'm an anthropologist and researcher in human ecology and health at the National School of Public Health at the Oswaldo Cruz Foundation, which is part of the Brazilian Ministry of Health. The title of my paper is Forgotten Experts in Our Midst, Traditional Indigenous Knowledge and Managing Changing Sahara Landscapes with Fire in Central Brazil. Cultural landscape burning practices and associated traditional ecological knowledge are key resources for fire management efforts in diverse world regions. Hegemonic tropical conservation narratives advocate for fire suppression based on the assumption that anthrop anthropogenic burning is at cross purposes with forest ecosystem integrity. This is especially the case in tropical forest regions in South America, where the predominant Amazonian forest model suggests all anthropogenic landscape burning is detrimental to forest cover and therefore an undesirable cause of carbon emissions. This viewpoint is well substantiated for canopy rainforests in tropical South America and is consistent with such important conservation programs as RED and RED+. However, it does not make as much sense for some other kinds of forests in tropical South America. For example, I conduct research in fire-adapted tropical savannas called cejados in central Brazil, which require periodic fire for their ecological functioning. In this regard, the Brazilian cejados are not unlike the chaparral in California, the kakadu savannas in Australia, or the geozilic grasslands in Angola. The Brazilian cejados have an unusual human ecological feature that is only shared by very few fire-adapted landscapes in the world. It is home to indigenous peoples who burn wide swaths of the landscape vegetation to facilitate group hunting activities and have done so continually for numerous generations. One of these groups that practices group hunting with fire call themselves the Atwe, although they're best known in the, Shivan, in the literature as the Shavanti. The Atwe are just one of many Sahada indigenous peoples who ignited savanna vegetation to facilitate hunting in the past, but they are now among one of, very, one of the very few who continue the practice uninterrupted since before they established permanent relations with Brazilian society, which occurred in 1946 for the Atwe. Thus, they present a rare opportunity to hold face-to-face -face conversations with indigenous hunters who ignite fire-prone vegetation according to deep-rooted cultural knowledge. Their knowledge of traditional indigenous fire reg regimes is alive, derived from accompanying and watching elders during group hunts, listening to elder stories and discourse about burning, and eventually igniting hunting fires on their own, all the while receiving community feedback regarding their successes and failures. To discuss outway landscape burning practices with the people who undertake them represents an exceptional opportunity to reassess prescribed burning recipes imported to Brazil from Australia and Africa in recent years, while honoring the native cultures and people that occupy this portion of the Brazilian territory. The Aue regularly ignite grasslands and scrublands within their now reduced legal territory during large group hunts to facilitate the acquisition of large quantities of game meat for dietary and, and ceremonial purposes. In fact, the very act of burning is a ceremonial event in the Aue culture. To neglect these social dimensions of Aue hunting with fire is to tell an incomplete story. Thus, I begin this presentation with a brief overview of the social dimensions of anthropogenic burning in this indigenous society. In turn, I will discuss Aue fire ecology and governmental efforts to incorporate indigenous peoples in fire management. My objective in this paper is to call attention to the potential value of Aue ecological knowledge, and more precisely, experienced Aue hunters for fire ecology management efforts in Brazil. For the Aue, burning is not just a subsistence or landscape management technique. As they understand the practice, it is also among the principal means of acquiring culturally appropriate gifts given to celebrate important ceremonial events, express feelings and of respect and gratitude towards others, promote positive social values among male youth, and maintain the group's ethnic identity. Weddings and rites of passage marking girls' and boys' passage into adulthood are some of the occasions that require the mobilization of large groups of hunters, often most of a village's men, and sometimes also participants from other villages because giving and receiving ample gifts of game meat are indispensable to their ceremonial performance. 
All Otway hunting burns are ignited by two principal hunters who run in wide opposing arcs to form a large closed circle of burning vegetation, often about six kilometers in diameter. In this slide, perhaps you can see two large plumes of smoke on the left and right sides of the skyline, which came from the fires set by these two hunters as they ran in a competitive race against each other. The other hunters enter the circle to ignite the vegetation in an irregular fashion. The result is a shifting outer ring of fire that burns from within as it expands outward. Hunters dis disperse in small groups, positioning themselves strategically to intercept large game animals crossing open ground as they flee approaching fire. Thus the technique does not involve corralling game animals with fire, but rather flushing them out from under cover so they are more easily dispatched with a rifle, bow and arrow, or even a club. Multiple hunters strategically coordinate to box in and drive game towards collaborating hunters. They coordinate with a complex re repertoire of hunting calls that communicate such information as what kind of animal is giving chase, where help is needed to cut off its path, and what reward will be given for assistance that leads to a successful kill. Hunting with fire only occurs during the drier months of the year. In May, when soil moisture is still quite high and tree foliage is lush, hunting with fire is only considered effective in open grasslands. Set in the late morning, after the dew has evaporated, these early season fires are low in temperature, spotty in coverage, minimally damaging to foliage, and usually die out at night as they reach obstacles such as waterways and tall stands of vegetation. The speed of vegetation recovery after these fires is impressive, with lush regrowth erasing most visual evidence of the fire within just a few weeks. Appropriate interval, intervals for burning moist grasslands can be as frequent as annually. From July to October, the Sahaba landscape is extremely dry, which permits the use of fire for hunting in thicker and taller vegetation types, such as scrubby Sahadus and dry upland forests. Especially towards the end of this season, hunting fires may not extinguish from one day to the next. Most Aoi do not consider smoldering Sahalu fires resulting from well-executed collective hunts to be evidence of environmental destruction. From their perspective, the rapid regeneration of burned vegetation and safety of animals not killed by hunters is ensured through deference to elders' knowledge of appropriate burning techniques. Appropriate intervals for burning Dry scrublands range from two to three years or more. In making decisions about where and when to burn, hunters take into account the spatial distribution and periodicity of fires. As they explain, if insufficient time has passed since a previous fire, the vegetation will not burn effectively and may be unduly stressed. Conversely, they express that if too much time has passed, fires burn too fast and hot which is dangerous for hunters, diminishes the effectiveness of the hunt, and prolongs vegetation regeneration. Other factors discussed during the planning of collective hunts with fire include time of year, vegetation type, ground moisture, foliage dryness, weather, natural fire barriers, as well as the location of neighboring properties and the ritual calendar. As the elders report, Meticulously tending to all of these factors ensures that hunting with fire does not result in destructively hot fires, unintentional killing of game animals, or wasting future hunting grounds on, an, on unproductive hunts. Thus, from the contemporary Otway point of view, the proper location, timing, and periodicity of burning simultaneously promote hunting success in the short term and landscape resource conservation in the long term. Nevertheless, the outweigh practice of collect collective hunting with fire faces at least two enormous hurdles. The first is its current restriction to federally recognized indigenous lands, which potentially concentrates such anthropogenic fires within smaller geographic areas than they were as recently as the 1970s. The second is a barrage of negative public opinion, including cultural shaming, with external scrutiny calling into question the, the ecological appropriateness of outweigh burning without supporting evidence or consideration of social and cultural dimensions. For example, a recent article published in a Brazilian geography journal presenting results of spatial analyses of outweigh hunting fires called the practice unsustainable and indiscriminate, 
even though the authors did no field work and spoke with no Awe people. For the Awe, however, environmental sustainability is not the only conservation issue involved in the recent dilemma of hunting with fire. Considered in isolation from other factors, it misses the central issue from the Awe point of view, which is the importance of collective hunting, including hunting with fire, for the social, cultural, and ethnic well-being of individuals as members of social groups. From their point of view, the relevant question is how, rather than whether, to hunt with fire sustainably. They see the social imperative to give and receive gifts, gifts of meat during weddings and initiation ceremonies as a reason to maintain the collective hunting with fire tradition in a manner that ensures its ongoing success and environmental viability in the long term. Recent Brazilian governmental efforts to promote integrated fire management in conservation areas and indigenous lands have prioritized incorporation of local stakeholders and their cultural burning knowledges. In their initial years, these initiatives tended to rely on top-down approaches that marginalized the indigenous voices they purported to integrate. It seems that more recently they have effectively prioritized the documentation of indigenous fire ecology knowledge and opened their methods to include more community discussion of appropriate fire regimes and fire management interventions. In step with the improvements in their integrated fire management approach, they expanded their program to include the formation of 45 indigenous fire brigades in, in 2021, including one comprised of exclusively female firefighters. It is unclear whether all of these brigades, which are required to complete the standard national training course, also benefit co from community-based approaches that prioritize intercultural dialogue and culturally determined interventions. To date, this program does not appear to have been extended to the outway. Perhaps more importantly, poly policymakers and fire management teams have yet to consult with outway hunters who are among the most experienced indigenous fire managers in the tropical savannas of central Brazil. Thus, thus, they have not been afforded opportunities to contribute to conservation discourse regarding their own historical territories or conservation areas outside indigenous lands. These individuals and communities remain forgotten conservation experts at a time of acute environmental vulnerability. It seems that all countries that purport to value indigenous fire, fire ecology knowledge have faced challenges in incorporating it into such fire management interventions as controlled burning and combating wildfires. The formation of indigenous fire brigades seems to involve inherent structural problems in reconciling hierarchical governance with community participation. Often efforts to do so are vulnerable to criticisms that indigenous viewpoints are subordinated to paradigmatic fire policy and indigenous social organization is subverted by certifying certain individuals as duly trained firefighters. Therefore, I'm unsure whether it is a bad thing that the government has yet to include Otway communities in the integrated fire management pro program. It may be preferable to allow them to practice their own burning traditions without governmental interference. Yet I do consider it an oversight to exclude the Otway from conservation discussions while including fire management pro professionals from other countries at great expense. In my opinion, there should be space for both. In addition, indigenous groups in Brazil who maintain deep cultural knowledge about tropical savanna ecology, such as the Aue, should be consulted directly rather than having their messages filtered through such non Aue researchers as myself. The experienced Aue hunters I know are true fire ecology experts and deserve to be recognized as such. Furthermore, they are often very skilled communicators who are best understood when given the opportunity to express themselves in their own ways, rather than being channeled into, the feeding, into feeding externally designed tables, charts, and calendars. It is also important to remember that the cultural setting I have sought to describe in this presentation is linked to the community's local ecological circumstances. My fieldwork, which I have represented in this paper, took place within just one of 10 outweigh indigenous lands in Brazil. This was the Pimentel Barbosa indigenous land, which is among the most distant from regional cities, culturally conservative and environmentally conserved. Currently, it has a population of about 2,600 people in an area of about 150,000 hectares. 
just 0.6% of this area is just deforested, a figure that has been stable over the last four decades. Other outweigh indigenous lands are comparatively more densely populated and more deforested. Nevertheless, the surrounding territory, which the outway of Pimental Barbosa freely accessed and burned as late as the 1970s, has changed substantially. Neighboring ranches are more intensively developed and better organized against what they seem to perceive as the threat of outway burning. Regional cities are larger and exert a stronger economic influence over the rural areas that surround them due to better roadways and transportation options. The outway have adjusted in tandem with these circumstances becoming more reflexive about their own cultural and environmental practices. They seek out and engage with scientists in order to evaluate the sustainability of their subsistence practices, including hunting with fire. They are now advocates for both environmental and cultural conservation, contributing to international discussions in diverse fields. In conclusion, I wish to reinforce my main message, which is that the Aotwe are fire ecology experts and should be included in national con conservation dialogue to ensure their ecological and cultural viewpoints are recognized by, by fire science and policy. Thank you very much. Really interesting presentation. Thank you, James. Um, I am going to start with the first question that someone's posted on the Hoover app. Um, can you see the question, James? No? Okay, I'll read it out. I was just, you're muted, by the way. Um, I just am likely to pronounce names wrong, so my apologies in advance. Um, so the question is, excellent presentation. Most experts recommend early burns, but the Zavante burn late with an accumulation of fuel. Even so, the Cerrado um, dos Cervantes is beautiful. I never understood it. You know why? I'm going to lean in here because I was told that my microphone is weak. So if, I, if, if I'm not being heard, please let me know. Um, you know, I, I honestly, I don't have an ecological response, a, a direct ecological response to that question. But I do believe that the Shavanchi have, uh, despite having a very different fire regime from uh, what the government believes is correct or the fire um, authorities and, and scientists believe is correct, which is early dry season burning, um, the environment believe, uh, appears to respond and to regrow very effectively. And the mosaic-like burns seem to contribute to a very diverse landscape and vegetation pattern. And the animal populations do not, anecdot anecdotally, do not seem to be negatively impacted. So I, you know, I don't have an answer for that, but I would say that I believe that the Shabanchi deserve to be heard because maybe the models that are being used currently are not necessarily the best models for this region. Does anybody else have any other questions? Luke, hi. I've got another question. Uh, thanks, James. I love that talk. It's super important and just really fascinating work that, that you're doing. Um, I just got a question about where you see things going in the future and, and do you have hope um, that more people in Brazil in particular will um, you know, learn to acknowledge the expertise of um, indigenous peoples and traditional owners. In, in Australia, we're going through a process of doing that. And I think that's probably the same in the US as well. But I just, I'm just wondering about the context in Brazil. I think that there's kind of two trends. Um, I believe that the government and uh, the Ministry of the Environment is becoming very progressive and is very proactive in uh, recognizing indigenous perspectives um, but all, all local stakeholders' perspectives, for that matter, um, especially traditional peoples uh, and indigenous peoples. Um, I believe that they're proactive. I believe that they're looking at it from the right point of view. Um, I'm not sure that um, my, my question for them would be whether they're able to incorporate indigenous voices and perspectives 
at the scale that they're now, now operating at because they are operating at a very high, large scale of fire brigades, indigenous fire brigades. Um, and I see that the time's up, so I'll just conclude by saying um, that on the other side of that is public opinion. And I think the public opinion will continue to be very against this, against all indigenous burning across the board. Mm -hmm. Thanks, James. Um, we can continue these discussions tomorrow also in our fire circle. So keep thinking, please. Um, so our final speaker for today is Dr. Dominic De La Sala. He is chief scientist at World Heritage in Oregon and former president of the Society for Conservation Biology in North America. His research focuses on forest and fire ecology, conservation biology and endangered species management and the importance of connecting policy with science. So Dominic has a great title for his talk that I'm going to let him um, say. So please, Dominic, thank you. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and good day to my friends in Australia. And I'm going to be talking about a paper that uh, we'll give you a sneak preview that is in the final stages of peer review, should be coming out sometime in January, and it's quantifying the significant impacts that we're seeing in Western forest uh, ecosystems from widespread fire suppression and active management approaches uh, that are targeting the so-called mega fire increases. And I'm betting that some of this is going to be controversial, but it's important to understand the effects that uh, these activities are having on ecosystems and the climate, particularly biodiversity. And that's what you're going to be getting out of the talk today. And the, the bottom line is that we are pouring massive amounts of money into wildfire suppression, for instance, and yet, as you can see from this graph, we have an increase in the area that has been burning since the 1980s when we are increasingly seeing a climate signal. And that graph shows both the Department of Interior spending and the US Forest Service spending in the US uh, in relation to the year and uh, the area burning. And you could see that uh, pattern of increase in fire activity as more money is being poured into it. Hence the analogy with Sisyphus pushing hey, the Dominic, boulder uphill. Um, I'm so sorry, this is Tanya Mickelson speaking. I just wanna make sure everyone can see your amazing slides that you have with your talk today. And it looks okay. like you are presenting in presenter mode. So I'm gonna have you um, restart your share if possible. If you can oh. just go ahead and um, stop that, open up your PowerPoint. Okay. And then uh, go ahead and click that slideshow um, in the top menu in the, that orange bar. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay, sorry about that. No worries. Um, again, I just wanted to make sure everyone could see those. So. Um, Whenever yeah. you're ready, you can probably go ahead and reshare your screen and get your slides back up. Okay, so can you see it now? Nope, you need to resh go ahead and click the share screen in Zoom. Okay, let's try this again. How's that? Nope, it did the same thing here, one sec. I'm trying to blow up my screen so I can see what you're seeing. Um, there we go. All right. Yeah, Perfect. sorry about that. No worries. Um, carry on. Yeah. So here's the graph that I was showing with increasing expenditures by, on the part of the federal agencies at the time, same time the uh, area burning has been increasing. So hence the analogy to Sisyphus pushing the boulder uphill. Now, interestingly, if you look at fire activity over the last 100 uh, plus years, you'll see three discrete periods. The uh, far left of the screen, during the early 1900s, there was a warm, dry climatic period and a lot of fire activity. 
That was followed by mid-century cooling. At the same time, we saw widespread fire suppression. There was this false sense of security that we could build millions of homes and power lines uh, in the Western forest without any problem because we could put fires out. And it was because of mechanized fire express, uh, suppression had achieved military scale activities in US forests. And that was uh, taking place with millions of homes being built in dangerous settings. And since the 1980s or so, we've entered the Anthropocene period of rapid climate change and we are headed for high emission scenarios and more fire activity. So there is a clear and increasing climate signal with the uh, recent fire activity that we're seeing in many regions around the world, particularly in the last four or so decades. At the same time, there has been this incredible increase in the number of human caused fires as we see from this graph in the different colors, the darker colors meaning even more uh, human ignitions, about 84% or so of the wildfires over a two decade period based on this study have been linked to uh, human activities. And this is almost never considered in uh, so-called fuel management approaches which function, which focus only on the fuel part of it and not the human ignition from unwanted human ignitions uh, that you see on this uh, particular figure. So in the meantime, uh, quantifying impacts from wildfire activities, mainly suppression on this slide, the things to note are the US at least is pouring billions of dollars into fire suppression. And at the same time, the Forest Service has been bipolar on it. And when we don't have a fire season, they talk about managed wildfire for ecological benefits. When we're in fire season, they talk about putting out all fire starts, even though they can't possibly do that, particularly under extreme fire weather. And you get all kinds of that activities on the landscape that are very damaging to ecosystems and that contribute to the climate crisis and the worsening of fire activity. And some of those impacts are depicted in this slide. And on the left of the slide are bulldozed tracks in wilderness areas, in national monuments and roadless areas that have uh, impacts. You've got thousands of firefighters cutting dozer lines in all places, landing pads, hoist sites, staging areas. You've got a backburn influence that can change fire severity and reduce the fire refugia in large fire complexes. Uh, some of those fires, about a third or so, are being influenced by backburns. These are very large burn areas that have a lot of human backburn uh, activity in it. So it's hard to quantify what's natural fire severity from backburn activity. All kinds of chemical retardants, uh, drawing water from reservoirs, rivers, even the Pacific Ocean. That's typically followed by, by weed invasions fuel breaks that act as roads and conduits for more weed invasions, soil damage, habitat fragmentation. All of this is often done in tandem with so-called mega fire active management approaches that also have cumulative impacts. Those approaches are somewhat depicted on this slide that the activities can include all kinds of thinning that remove both large and small trees post-fire logging, clear cuts with minimal environmental review. In the US, that's referred to as categorical exclusions from uh, the review under the National Environmental Policy Act, which means that they could push through these large uh, clear cuts with minimal review and minimal public input. It could include prescribed burning. The byproducts could be cross-laminated timber, biomass energy as so-called restoration byproducts. All of these activities have cumulative effects. They can shift ecosystems into unnatural conditions, as you can see on the slides here. In the US, there's a big buildup of such activities through millions of dollars that are now, actually billions of dollars that are now going into subsidizing more of these activities as fire uh, area is going up. And that was recently uh, passed in the US as the infrastructure bill, 
uh, signed by President Biden. It has all kinds of logging subsidies in it for the so-called resilience and fuel management. Now, often there's a lot of talk about protecting large trees, but that's seldom defined. And what we see on the ground, as you can see these marked trees, the tree in the center is about a 19 inch diameter ponderosa pine. The two trees surrounding it, which are also fire resistant, are marked for cutting. And those are much bigger. And this is done under the guise that it's freeing up the ponderosa pine, but you can see that those are very large trees that are being taken to protect the center tree there in, in the pine forest, the mixed conifer forest. And so we really need to get specific about what we mean by protecting large trees because it's not happening on the ground. There's all kinds of these activities taking place even in endangered species habitat, such as the Northern Spotted Owl under the assumption that uh, fire is bad for spotted owls, canopy closure reductions are, are uh, coming in at below the threshold needed to maintain nesting and uh, roosting habitat for spotted owls. In some of the simulation studies that we've done, we've shown that thinning under the spotted owl recovery plan would actually remove much more habitat for the owl than projected fires over a 40 year period. We weren't the only ones that have documented that. Even some federal researchers did. All of that information has been ignored by the Fish and Wildlife Service in issuing all kinds of take permits to allow these activities in owl cores and has been ignored by the Forest Service. And it's controversial. There's a lot of back and forth in the literature on whether fire is good or bad for the owl. We think that mixed severity fire produces uh, foraging habitat and the fire refugia within those complexes is uh, nesting habitat. And it's not really fire that's causing the decline of owl, but the logging activities before and after fire are the main effects. The uh, whole issue of protecting large trees was recently taken uh, down in the Eastern Oregon, Washington forest where large trees, as you can see from this graph, uh, accumulate the vast majority of carbon in those forests. When trees get above 50 centimeters diameter, breast height, that's when they really take off in their uh, carbon accumulation. But recently the agencies with support of some of the scientific community that's talking about protecting large trees took down the large tree protection standards. So I have to ask what's really being protected? What is large and what are the impacts of taking those large trees, even if they are not fire resistant? They may be the only structure that is in those forests that is large. And again, it has most those large trees, whether they're fire resistant or not, have most of the carbon. Then there's the emissions part of it. There's this kind of comical, uh, man drinking uh, a beer there. He's Australian, I understand. And he's, you know, the phrase there is that I'll cut my alcohol consumption by 2050. Well, this is pretty much what's going on in the global discussions about reducing emissions. And we're seeing it playing out in forest. You can see all the information here on this slide showing that by far logging is contributing to more emissions than the fires that it's supposed to be reducing. And in some cases, the, the order of magnitude is tenfold. When you look at scaling up the kind of logging that's being talked about to reduce fire intensity, it's producing way more emissions than those fires would. And then the products are being turned into bio, bioenergy uh, products to put more emissions into the atmosphere. And in the meantime, the kinds of logging, industrial scale logging that we're seeing is contributing to more fire severity. We've seen this not only in the US, but we've seen it in Australia as well. And we're seeing it in British Columbia now as more studies are looking at the connection between logging and uncharacteristic uh, high severity fires and emissions. So it begs the question about what do we mean by restoration? And in restoration circles, we need to define what we mean. What's the baseline? And the baseline is a multivariant analysis of composition, structure, and process, and function, and moving a degraded stand 
or system into more of the baseline. And what we're seeing with a lot of these uh, active management approaches is more like forest engineering. It's using logging to reduce fuels and calling that restoration, when restoration is a much bigger issue and resilience is a much bigger issue. It involves biodiversity at all scales, especially biodiversity mediated by uh, mixed severity fire. It involves ecosystem integrity, connectivity, climate refugia, carbon management, and it involves reducing anthropogenic stressors. That's what true restoration and resilience means. Thinning could be a component of that, but it's not by itself restoration or resilience management. We have to stop the degradation first. So there's this big question, does thinning really work to reduce fire intensity? And the results are mixed. The science is not settled on this, contrary to what I've been seeing recently in some of the literature, the science is not all but settled. It really depends. You've got to do everything right that you see on that slide there. Leave all the large trees on the site, then from below, vary the spacing, avoid clear cutting the understory through mastication of shrubs and herbicide applications. Use prescribed burning, not pile burning. Contain the flammable weeds and the vectors of those weeds, close and obliterate roads, then maybe you got it right. And even if you get it right, there's a very low chance that the site that you thinned is going to encounter a fire when the fuels are at the lowest. So that means, at least from some advocates, you really have to scale up the activities to hit that bullseye. And in doing so, you're causing more impacts and you're putting more emissions into the atmosphere. So you have to really question whether this is the best approach. Then there's the notion of post-fire logging, which is also part of the, uh, the checklist of management activities that are being done and associated with mega fires. This is the worst possible thing you can do to ecosystems after a fire. It puts them into a destructive loop where you take out the biological legacies that are the most important part of the regenerating forest, you replace it with plantations that then burn again in uncharacteristic fires, and then you salvage log again. And you know there are all kinds of impacts that have been documented across different taxa, impacts to soils, invasive species, more emissions going into the atmosphere, contributing to more fires. We're approaching this at the wrong scale. We should be reducing the emissions load from forestry, from fossil fuels to eventually slow these fires down. Now, the other thing that we hear a lot about is the precaution, precautionary principle is preventing active management, the so-called paralysis analysis. This is dangerous and it is used all the time by pro developers to bypass environmental regulations, the precautionary principle has a long history of international sustainability concepts. It comes out of the Earth Summit and before the Earth Summit, the Stockholm Declaration in the 1970s, its underlying uh, policies all over Europe and in the United States, it's uh, the principal component of the Endangered Species Act. Yet we keep hearing, we need to get rid of the precautionary principle. At the same time, federal agencies are pushing through massive logging projects with minimal environmental reviews under the categorical exclusion and emergency determination authorities that they have access to. So the precautionary principle is not the problem. Finally, I need to respond to this notion of agenda-driven science. I just wrote a book on this. And I've seen this thrown not only at Einstein, uh, but at scientists that are speaking about the inconvenient truth of our impacts on the planet. And the precautionary principle is what is necessary that we need to be looking at and talking about and not accusing those that are raising red flags about these activities of having an agenda. And that is just taking away from the honest dialogue that needs to be going back and forth in the, in the science uh, community, the recent papers in ecological applications, the trio of papers and the special feature failed to even talk about any of the rebuttals to the papers that were published that questioned 
these activities that they were responding to. So it was a very biased review of the literature and accusing scientists of having an agenda instead of, hey, let's work these out. Let's figure out where our differences are. Let's try to resolve these differences using the scientific method. That's the way we conduct business in science, not by uh, talking about agenda driven, particularly when those that are pushing for more of these activities, those activities are, are tied to commercial logging, which has an economic motive to it. Then on the last uh, couple of slides here, I wanna talk about how we see the world and how we see forest and fires in particular really determines what we think about these issues. And you know, when we look at the landscape ecologically, there's no such thing as a good fire or a bad fire. Fire just is, it's a self-willed ecological process that has ecological beneficial effects on the landscape. To call it good or bad is very subjective. And if we're gonna do that, we really need to find what we mean by good versus bad fire. So I wanna just wrap it up here by my final slide that uh, in order to avoid the Sisyphean approach and the subjugation of nature that we're seeing with widespread um, fire suppression and widespread active management approaches is that all severities are important and all fire severities in the Western United States are at historical deficits. Biodiversity begets biodiversity. I co-authored a book on that. Uh, we need more of that on the landscape, not less. We cannot put the fire genie back in the bottle. We need to figure out how we can coexist with more fire on the landscape. We need to treat the root causes and not just the effects. And the root causes are putting more emissions into the atmosphere, thinking that that's going to tame down these fires. And with a higher emission scenario, it's not gonna work. A high emission scenario will render these activities increasingly ineffective. We need more surgical application of this to reduce the impacts to homes, to the built uh, infrastructure. We need to look at resilience more holistically and not just in, in terms of uh, managing fuels, but looking at the whole ecosystem for its components and not just one component. And lastly, the true paralysis comes from irreversible harm to nature and to uh, the objectivity compromised by confirmation bias, depending on how you look at the world and how you look at forests determines what you think and therefore your, um, your objectives and recommendations. So I'll stop there and just, uh, I don't know if there's any time for questions, but, but um, thank you for that. Right, thank you, um, Dominic. That was a um, very thought-provoking uh, presentation. Uh, we do have time for maybe two quick questions or one question. We have one question. We have to stop at um, in two minutes, basically. So, please, does somebody have a question? I can't see one on the on the chat. Just to unmute yourself if you would like to ask a question. Luke, lovely, thank you. I'll, I'll ask one and while well, the other speakers are collecting their thoughts. Um, thanks, Dominic. That's really thought provoking, and you know, I think in lots of parts of the world there is this tension between you know ecological thinning and fuel reduction and trying to protect biodiversity, but there's also you know malpractice as well. Um, you mentioned the, the science isn't settled, so I'm just interested in what kind of experiments you'd like to see done to settle the science. You know, I, I think that what really needs to happen is we've got to understand these impacts better, and they're being pushed aside as if they're insignificant. We haven't done nearly the, uh, the level of comprehensive analyses on carbon emissions in relation to what's being talked about on these ecosystems. I think we need to be a lot more aware of the trade-offs. We've got to document those trade-offs. We've got to come to an understanding of how this is affecting biodiversity. I really think the two fields are heading in opposite directions. 
you've got an entire field focusing on fuels and the ecology of fuels management. And you got an entire field that's focusing on biodiversity and climate change. And we are two ships passing in the night. And unless we get it together and work together, we're going to see increasing impacts that are not going to be mitigated and are going to make the situation worse. I think that's more a question of bringing research teams together than constructing experimental designs and then figuring out how to translate that into actual management on the ground so that the managers are aware of these impacts and are properly mitigating them. Mm -hmm. Bringing people together, it's a very important part of, you know, trying to find solutions for the future, isn't it, or approaches. Um, so thanks again, Dominic, and thank you everyone for um, coming to the session today. Hopefully you will come to our fire circle tomorrow when we'll have time to discuss, discuss all these issues in greater detail. I also didn't get to one question that was directed to biodiversity earlier today. My apologies. And we can talk about that tomorrow. Okay. Thanks a lot, everyone. And see you at the fire circle tomorrow. Wonderful. Thanks, speakers. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, and just a reminder, this session is recorded and will be available in Whova, our real our uh, Congress app after within two weeks after the Congress ends. Um, and if you haven't already, be sure to check out the exhibitor booths to connect with Congress sponsors and partners. Um, and this concludes the second day of the Congress. We look forward to continuing learning and connecting with all of you tomorrow. Thanks so much and good evening. Thank you.